Good evening. Welcome everyone to tonight's uh, virtual program where we'll be exploring the book Reaganland. We're re re revisiting the Reagan years and learning the impact of that era on modern conservatism. Uh, my name is Bo Mendez. I'm the manager of programs and digital communications here at Brooklyn Historical Society. So it's my honor and privilege to welcome you all here tonight um, for a virtual program. We wish we could welcome you to our space, uh, but for the time being, like so many other places, out of concern for everyone's health and safety, we are going to be keeping things online. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we get to the meat of tonight's discussion, I'd just like to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, we are a history center that's dedicated to preserving and celebrating the history of Brooklyn, uh, but we also talk about things that may not have happened in Brooklyn, but definitely were felt in Brooklyn. We look at the, uh, the impact of history on local trends as well as national and sometimes even global events. Um, tonight, we are continuing something of a loose series that we've established uh, where we are exploring the history, the recent history uh, of the Republican Party and the American conservative movement. Uh, this is something that's always popped up in our, uh, in our topics of conversation because they have had such an impact on the, the shaping and the, and the guidance of American history. Um, since we made the pivot to virtual programs, we had the pleasure of hosting Heather Cox Richardson, uh, discussing her book, How the South Won the Civil War, which looked at uh, the creation of the movement conservative. Recently, we hosted Julian Zelizer sharing his new book, Burning Down the House, which looked at the career of Newt Gingrich. But of course, we can't tell this story without talking about the Reagan years. So we are very excited to welcome back author Rick Perlstein, who will be sharing uh, his book, Reaganland, uh, tonight. But before we get to uh, that conversation, we uh, are continuing to offer virtual programs like these, and we have a few coming down uh, soon uh, that we are greatly looking forward to and hope to have you joining us uh, for. Next week, we are partnering with 13, and we will be hosting a screening and discussion of the film American Masters, Mae West, Dirty Blonde. This will be taking place on August 26th, which is uh, International Women's Equality Day. So we'll be looking back at the life of a Brooklyn-born uh, feminist icon and discussing her legacy uh, with a panel of experts. You can learn more about that program on our website. Um, last night, we also launched an observation of the 100-year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which granted uh, many women, but not all women, the right to vote. Um, we are hosting this series, Women and Power, which, looked at, which looks at 100 years since that milestone and the battles that have been fought to secure that greater equality and the things, the work that is still left unfinished, the things that we will have to fight for in the future. Uh, we hosted a conversation with Tressie McMillan Cotton and Jennifer Finney Boylan, uh, moderated by uh, Raquel Willis. And we are hosting part two on September 9th with a program called Economic Power. Uh, we'll be talking about um, just the role that women have played uh, in the economy, what the landscape is like for the workplace, um, the discussion of, discussion of the wage gap, and how things can be rethought and reimagined in order to achieve greater equality in the workplace. That will be on September 9th. And to learn more about that program, uh, please visit our website, brooklynhistory.org. Um, a little bit, a quick note about how tonight's program uh, will work. Um, in just a moment here, I'll be bringing on our esteemed speakers, uh, Rick, the author of Reaganland, and our uh, wonderful moderator, Jeffrey Tubin. Um, throughout the course of the conversation, we welcome your questions and encourage them. So if you have any questions for our speakers, you can submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, we are also very excited to be uh, partnering with Brooklyn Zone Community Bookstore on 7th Avenue as our bookseller for tonight's program. Um, and they will be uh, available to, to uh, offer online ordering and curbside pickup if you're in the area of books like Reaganland. And we will sh be sharing a link how you can learn more about Reaganland and purchase your copy whenever you feel like it. Um, and with all that said, I would just like to go ahead and uh, thank everyone once again, continue looking out for one another. Um, and that's enough out of me. I'm uh, very excited to bring on uh, our moderator for tonight, um, Jeffrey Tubin, who is the best-selling author of The Oath, The Nine, Too Close to Call, A Vast Conspiracy, conspiracy The Run of His Life, uh, which was made into the critically acclaimed FX series American Crime Story, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, and most recently, True Crimes and Misdemeanors, which just came out 
earlier this summer. Uh, please welcome uh, Jeffrey Tubin. Can you hear me? I think, yes. there we go. All right, great. Uh, and with that, um, I'll leave things in your very capable hands. Very excited to see this conversation unfold. Uh, thank you for uh, acting as moderator tonight and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, that's great. I, I don't, is, is Rick up? Are you there, Rick? I don't see your picture. Uh, I think we, there he is. Are you there, Rick? I'm, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. We're all set. Okay. I, it is my pleasure and honor to, um, to host this conversation with the great Rick Perlstein. Rick, Rick and I are, are old friends by now. And, you know, his quartet of books about American politics and society is really one of the great intellectual and historical achievements of our time. This is an incredible four, four books. Uh, just to refresh your memory, if you don't know, they, they began, it began with Before the Storm, published almost exactly 20 years ago, uh, about fundamentally the Goldwater campaign in 1964. Then uh, Nixon Land, which was about uh, the rise of, of, the, of Richard Nixon. Uh, the Invisible Bridge, which uh, was about sort of the, the fall of Nixon and Watergate and um, th that, that period. And now uh, we are here to discuss and celebrate Reagan Land, which it's interesting, you know, it, it, we, we it, it, we think of it as sort of the Reagan era, but the, the actual years of Rick's book are the Jimmy Carter years, the, the, the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's just, I, I was a teenager during this period and it was really fun for me to relive some, some of the politics and law. But let me just start, Rick, by asking you, like, how did you start this? How did you get this obsessive interest in the rise of the conservative movement starting when you were a, a young graduate of the University of Chicago? It started much before that. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I, I have a kind of standard answer to that question and it involves uh, people who've listened to a lot of interviews with me know me turning 16, getting my driver's license and spending all my spare time driving to the Renaissance bookstore in downtown Milwaukee, which was this ramshackle five-story used book emporium, uh, which had uh, magazines in the very, very musty basement and reading old magazines and reading books uh, by Black Panthers that had America spelled with KKK in the middle and John Burke Society ministers and all the rest. Uh, I've, I've kind of expanded out that answer. So it definitely started with an obsession with the 60s. But when I was even younger than that, I remember getting up early on Sunday mornings and being glued to the screen watching fundamentalist TV preachers hmm. and being, I think, absolutely fascinated by the coexistence of all these different tribes of America. Uh, the fact that these people would never show up in my, you know, suburban Jewish Milwaukee neighborhood. Um, Certainly another aspect was, um, there's, a, there's a French feminist theorist named Julia Kristeva, and she said all theory is a form of autobiography. We're all kind of working out our, our struggles. Maybe someday I'll ask you about that. Okay, well, uh, for, but, but, we'll, but we'll put are, a pin in that. But, but uh, uh, well, I, you know, I grew up with a, 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 a father who was a small businessman. He owned a career company, and he would always talk about how um, the government bureaucrats were all out to get him. And uh, in the case of my parents, uh, they were um, strong uh, Zionists. My dad used to um, hang plastic models of Israeli tanks and planes throughout the house. He studied the battle maps from, from the Seven Day War and the 1973 war, and I was a liberal. And uh, this thing seemed very strange to me, this whole kind of tribal obsession. Uh, so you kind of put that all together, me getting into political arguments with my parents, uh, always trying to win and, you know, you can't, you can't beat your parents really, uh, you know, being, being completely voyeuristic, voyeuristically fascinated by, you know, TV preachers, you know, talking about, you know, uh, how if you, you know, fall down on your knees and accept Jesus and send in a check for 10 bucks, you know, you'd be saved, washed in the blood of the lamb. And this absolute 
obsession with the melodrama of the 1960s. And, uh, and, and let me just stop you right there because yeah. you know the, the melodrama of the 1960s is often portrayed exactly. as sort of the era of hippies and the right. era of free love and 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 you know, rock and roll and Woodstock and, and the, the Vietnam protests. And that's not what you have focused that's right. on. You, what, what is right. your, what, what have you studied about right. the six? So what happened was when I kind of, you know, reached my maturity and went to college and spent two years in graduate school and ended up in New York as a magazine editor and, you know, started looking for a book project that could consume me, um, I realized that um, the 60s was, much less uh, the story of kind of the rise and fall of uh, this idealistic movement for civil rights and uh, you know ending the Cold War and the Vietnam War and all the rest. Much much less that than a civil war between right and left. And uh, you know you could read a book about you know called literally called on the cover quote unquote the 1960s and there wouldn't be a mention of Richard Nixon except the guy that someone was chanting against, you know, there wouldn't be a mention of Barry Goldwater. And, uh, you know, to make a long story short, uh, I realized that that was just this enormous lacuna in the whole story. And so uh, I hit upon the Goldwater campaign. And the thing that fascinated me at first was, you know, not that Goldwater had all these support among, you know, Southern segregationists, which he did, you know, not that he had the support of all these kind of uh, factory owners in the Midwest, which he did, but the fact that he had this um, strong cadre of young supporters in college and in their 1920s, in their 20s, I should say, who were galvanized by Barry Goldwater for the same reason that other people were galvanized by the new left. This idea that 1950s society had become completely wrapped up in this straitjacket of conformity and that Barry Goldwater was a rebel. Barry Goldwater was a guy who was fighting against the big bureaucracy, that his rhetoric and a lot of key points very closely resembled a Mario Savio, the leader of the free speech movement in Berkeley, who said, you know, you need to throw yourself against the, the gears of the machine, right? Barry Goldwater very much spoke in that way. So this is also a 60s movement. Right. Okay. But before we get into sort of the, the, the meat and substance of your book, I'd like to ask just a couple questions about process because mm -hmm. I, you know, as a fellow writer, I, I, I am so fascinated by, you know, your work, I, I suppose, you know, is in the broad category of political history, but what makes it so rich and fun is that, you know, it's, it's cultural history as well. And, you know, this is a book about, Ron, about, you know, to a, you know, in, in broad terms about Jimmy Carter and, and Ronald Reagan, but it's also about Star Wars and Saturday Night Fever and, um, and the, you know, in the blackout in, in, in New York. And how do you, how, you know, you, you write about like what's on television. Mm -hmm. in, that's not an easy thing to, to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to scroll through the New York Times, um, you know, from the 1970s. But, uh, you know, one of my favorite bizarre facts in your book is that Susan Ford, who mm -hmm. was one of Gerald Ford's daughters, did yeah. a commercial for Subaru yeah. and said, you know, I'm a Ford, buy a Subaru. Like, how could you have possibly found that out? And, and how did you do the, the sort of cultural side of your research? Well, it's right there in, you know, Newsweek, right? I mean, the in between those weighty articles about, you know, the Panama Canal Treaty and who's going to win the Senate race in, you know, North Carolina in 1978 are advertisements, right? And uh, the fundamental idea behind this kind of uh, historical methodology is the idea that people in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, and today live their lives without any real boundary between politics and culture. Uh, in fact, I, I uh, luckily have a theorist, a political theorist, who uh, has been able to articulate this with epigrammatic brilliance, epigrammatic brilliance, Stephen Bannon, who said, politics is downstream of culture. In other words, culture happens first. And in the case of Ronald Reagan, I think that's, um, I think I hope to establish in the book, that that's very hard to argue with that when George Lucas 
uh, came out of the you know world of almost kind of avant-garde 1970s filmmaking, right? Uh, his first film was this dystopian science fiction movie. It did no business, but the people he hung out with were, you know, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, uh, Michael Cimino, the people who were making films that were very adult, very morally ambiguous. Think of something like Taxi Driver, right? Uh, think of something, The Last Tango in Paris, which is basically about a random sexual encounter that ends with a rape and a murder. But these movies did very big business. Last Tango in Paris was on the cover of Time and Newsweek. Along comes this guy, George Lucas, and he says, you know, they don't make children's movies anymore. You know, he grew up on, you know, uh, serials of the kind that literally Ronald Reagan had started in which uh, there were cowboys, there were Indians, there were, you know, people in the jungle, there were, you know, um, and he said, people don't go to movies in which they're good guys and bad guys and never the twain shall meet. I'm gonna make one of these. I'm gonna make a Disney movie in which the kids will absolutely be able to grasp, you know, the way you're supposed to live. And lo and behold, he, he makes Star Wars and the, hung, the, the, the public seems to be so longing for this narrative which literally brings back a lot of shot-for-shot shot remakes of, of classic Hollywood. You know, you've got, you know, for, for the comedy, they have the, the, the fat short guy and the tall skinny guy. They happen to be robots, right? right. You have, you know, uh, you have, you know, like great best stretches of desert, like in, like in Algiers, or, you know, uh, uh, you have, you know, um, the bar scene from Casablanca. And if you look at someone like Han Solo, he's almost exactly like Rick from Casablanca. You know, he's, he's kind of this guy who, you know, might have been involved in some kind of moral struggle, but, you know, has, you know, decided to kind of throw it all away for, you know, some mercenary work, right? So you have this movie which really kind of goes back to the pre-70s, pre-60s, pre-lapsarian world in which America was innocent and America longed for innocence. The same way I have a whole chapter in Star Wars. So people were willing to watch and pay their money for Reagan night. Ideas that culture kind of conditions consciousness that later finds its expression in is, is and about politics. what used to be called. I don't know; it may still be called the new right. Mm -hmm. You know, the the uh, the um, you know the, the conservative movement that uh, Reagan was part of, but never entirely. Wow. Uh, little bit about what is Reagan said, yeah. said, where, you know, Jimmy Carter gets elected a Democrat. Yeah. He is not a figure of the new right. But, but where is the new right in so 1976? The new right is one of those words that's so resonant. Uh, it makes so much sense to people that people use it in all kinds of ways. Like they'll say, oh, Goldwater was part of the new right. right? Or Newt Gingrich was part of the new right. At the time in the mid 70s, it was a very specific thing. It was a very specific, small cadre of people. And they basically were coming right after the new left, you know, so they basically, you know, kind of got the idea for the name from the new left. And what they saw themselves as uh, in the middle of the 1970s were people who were going to rescue uh, the Republican Party, although they also claimed to be just as interested in taking over the Democratic Party from, you know, the establishment. I talked about how um, Barry Goldwater sounded like Mario Savio talking about, you know, the, 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 the bureaucrats that were kind of, you know, forcing this conformity. They really kind of came out of that attitude. And um, a lot of them kind of came into politics by rejecting the compromises of Richard Nixon, just like Barry Goldwater came out of rejecting the compromises of Dwight Eisenhower. But they considered Barry Goldwater a sellout. You know, when he came back to the, 19, the, the, the Senate in 1969, he was much more interested in kind of seeing himself as, you know, part of the club. So this was a group of people that often came from quite modest working class backgrounds. You know, Richard Vigory's mom used to um, sell milk from the family cow. You know, uh, um, you know. People Richard Gregory just is is a direct male. Uh, he's one of the he's he's one of, he's he's known as the Godfather of the new, new right. Another one of them's dad managed a Sears in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Right. So they were not people to the manor born, and they were people who um, basically decided that the route to 
uh, conservative hegemony was scouring the horizon and finding discontents. And they were everywhere in the 1970s. There was the Boston busing crisis. You know, something I wrote about in my last book, The Invisible Bridge, was the textbook wars in Kanawha County, West Virginia, in which fundamentalist Christians were complaining about the cosmopolitan, liberal, you know, multicultural textbooks that were being shoved down their, their kids' throats that were making them kind of question Christianity, right? They would find these discontents and they would, they would literally parachute in and organize these people, get them connected with Washington. For example, when one of the textbook warriors dynamited the school board in Charleston, West Virginia, the Heritage Foundation sent in a lawyer to defend them and hooked them up with all these other textbook uh, people all over the country. Gun rights were a very big one. And the establishment, you know, the people who were, you know, basically the establishment pundits of the day were absolutely horrified that these people were um, basically finding the most lowest common denominator, demagogic emotional issues, and using them as a route to political power. And these guys, one of them was, was, was Richard Vigory, another guy was a, a guy named Howard Phillips, uh, uh, Paul Weyrich. They would not apologize. And one of the things no. that made them really distinguished was their willingness to com completely steamroll all the accepted norms of political civility. So that's and, what the and, new right was. And, and how does the new right merge with sort of the traditional Republican Party, right. you know, which supports big business and, right. and uh, you know, low taxes? Um, right. the, the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the Republican Party right. of, you know, Robert Taft and Gerald Ford, right. not the Republican Party also, of yeah. you know, Richard Vigory and, and Paul Weirich. How, how, do, how does that, how do they yeah. come together? So one of the fascinating things about these guys is they had just as much contempt for unions and government social programs and uh, government intervention in the economy as, you know, any establishment Washington conservative. They often quite cynically saw these divisive social issues as a way to recruit ordinary people in heartland America, what we now call red America, often working class people. All these people that were organizing West Virginia were union militants. You know, that's why they were so good with dynamite. <laughs> you know, they, they, they'd use their dynamite against the bosses, right? Uh, and, and they would literally, exp they would literally, they were very, very frank about what they were trying to do. And they would say, we are trying to organize discontent to get people to use things that anger them now. And they often involve sex. Paul Weyrich called sex the Achilles heel of the liberal Democrats. And how, how, so, like, about, what do you mean using sex? What did they do to use sex? So the idea that um, of, of, of gender equality, the idea of divorce, the idea of abortion, the idea of uh, feminism, uh, the idea of sexual iniquity, right? right. That was on, homosexuality. Um, Sexuality, okay. sex. Right, oh, in general, yeah. Yeah, sex in general. And well, they would say, people are angry about sex and will use their anger about sex to convince them that the problem is not that sexual mores are going down the toilet, but that liberals in Washington are in conspiracy with, um, with, 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 with all kinds of elites to put them down. And, and there's a set piece in your book about, I mean, I, you know, a lot, a lot of what I read in, in Reaganland, you know, rang, rang a bell of familiarity. This didn't, I didn't remember this at all. Proposition six. What uh, was Proposition six? Proposition six is uh, a perfect example. Uh, I actually um, just unplugged my microphone. Uh, does that, do I sound okay? You sound fine. Okay, great. Proposition six, that was uh, an initiative campaign in, in 1978 in California. There were two famous initiatives. Of course, California has this very strange system of direct democracy where it's quite easy to get onto the either a primary ballot or a general election ballot, a initiative where the people can change the laws, right? And often you can hire people to, to collect your signatures for you. So it's not very difficult. One famous one during the primary season was Proposition 13 which was a radical uh, revision of the property tax laws uh, that really just decimated public finances in California for a generation, which also had a real strong new right element. Proposition six, uh, uh, to back up, in 1977, a popular 
singer, very kind of straight lace square singer who was famous for her patriotic songs and her uh, commercials for, for Florida orange juice named Ornita Bryant spearheaded a campaign in Miami to have an initiative to overturn one of the many gay rights laws that were passing around the country. So again, sex, this idea that the sexual mores were, were being uh, undone, that our parents' generation's values were being undone. And it was extremely successful. It won by a proportion of two to one. Jerry Falwell came down there. It was very ugly. There were um, um, vigilante attacks on gays. Uh, Jerry Falwell uh, gave a speech at a big rally in which he said, homosexuals would just as soon kill you as look at you. Very ugly stuff. And this guy named John Briggs, who was an ambitious but not very intelligent state senator from Fullerton, California, decides that this is his ticket to the state house. He's gonna run against Jerry Brown for governor and he's gonna ride on Anita Bryant's coattails. So he manages to um, get on the ballot a law that um, stipulates that no gays, lesbians, bisexuals, all the rest could teach in California schools. And it even went further than that. No one speaking in support of gays and lesbians should, could teach, teach in California schools. It was um, terrifying to the gay community. And in the polls, it was immediately kind of rocketed uh, to the top. Uh, and in fact, the guy who was the head of kind of the establishment gay community in, Cal in California, this guy named David Goodstein, who was the, the editor of a gay magazine, gay newspaper called The Advocate, and you can see this story told very well in, in the film Milk, said gays should be active in this campaign behind the scenes. Literally, he was so terrified of pogroms against gays that he told people that they should be the ones stuffing the envelopes. It should be our heterosexual friends who are in the front forefront of this movement. And two very heroic, courageous, brilliant individuals said, no, we need to come out. We need to educate the people of California that we are your neighbors, we are your relatives. And one of them was one of the first gay public officials in the United States. San Francisco City Supervisor Harvey Milk. And another was a much more obscure figure who was in a, um, he came from a, a, then a rural town, now a very Tony kind of wine country town called Heldsburg. His name was Larry Burner and he came out. He was an elementary school teacher. He looked and sounded like Mr. Rogers, this brilliant teacher. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna come out. And, and he became the poster child for this guy Briggs who just absolutely you know, said that the, the, the gays were out to recruit your children, that they were gonna be raping them in bathrooms. One of the fascinating things I discovered in the book is in the 1950s and the early 1960s, a lot of reactionary politics was, was segregationist, right? It was, it, was, it was this horrifying, terrifying racist against, race, racism against African-Americans. By the 1970s, especially the late 1970s, that sort of racism was completely verboten it was forbidden. You can't, couldn't say those things. Maybe you could dog a whistle, let me, you couldn't say them. And that the hate migrated almost seamlessly to gays and lesbians and feminists. And it was just as nasty and more nasty. All through this campaign, there were, there were murders of gays and lesbians. Now, now Lo and behold, let's, should let's, I give the ending away? Just, just, all right, we, we, won't, we won't give away the Proposition 6 ending. But, You'll but, have to read the book on that one. Yeah, that's right. But, but the, the thing that, that I th found so interesting about the Proposition 6 discussion, it's kind of a metaphor for the Democratic Party. Because, I mean, mm. obviously you write, uh, I mean, the, the book is, you know, sort of more about the Republicans than the Democrats, but obviously it is a broad political history. Lots of Democrats, too. Yeah. And, and but, but your, I think it's safe to say, contempt for the mealy mouth nature of how Democrats uh, campaign and govern is a theme, I think, of, of, of all your work. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Sure. <laughs> we'll stipulate so, to that, Counselor. Well, well and, 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 and let's just talk a little bit, since he's the president during the entire book, about Jimmy Carter, because, you know, he is now a figure of really distant history. Amazingly enough, he's, he's yeah. still alive. Uh, but um, talk about how, what his rise said about where America was in 1976 when he won. He ran the most 
unique, brilliant, amazing, miraculous campaign in the history of presidential campaigning in 1976. So it starts in my last book, Invisible Bridge. All the way back in 1974, he's going from farmstead to farmstead, knocking on doors and saying, I'm running for president. on this guy named Jimmy Carter, right? You know, remember the joke about when he told his mom, Miss Lillian, that I was, he was running for president? Do you remember what she said? President of what, right? President of what, exactly. Yeah. So he uh, is the guy who comes up with this original strategy of coming out hard at the gate in Iowa, which was not that big a deal before 1976. He wins the Iowa caucus. And um, the reason he was such a compelling figure was this is after Vietnam, after America loses its first war. It's after uh, Watergate in which you know, America learns that their president is a, basically a mafia don. And he looks to the American people in the eye and says, I will not lie to you. I'm just a modest peanut farmer. He wasn't, he was a peanut warehouser. He had a pretty big business. He wore flannel shirts in his TV commercials. He would you know, sift the soil and talk about the land his family had been you know, farming since the 18th century. And he uh, presented such a compelling vision of innocence of uh, redemption, uh, this idea that he was this honest four-square Christian. Now, that posed quite a challenge when it came time for him to begin governing in 1977, because right. what he never said when he was on the campaign trail in 1976 was that his most, um, most controlling and guiding ideology was austerity that uh, Americans lived in too much luxury. Uh, they um, were too selfish. Uh, they were too greedy. And he talked all the time about how Americans needed to turn to the moral values of sacrifice that their parents had experienced in World War II, right? Which made for quite a contrast to this guy, Ronald Reagan, who we'll, I'm sure get to later, who said, I'm gonna cut all your taxes and America's the greatest country ever and we don't have any problem in the world that Americans acting like Americans can't solve on their own. Okay, right. and let, let me just stop you there for a second because, um, you know, I mean, obviously Reagan is someone you have steeped yourself in. I mean, in, in the last book, there's practically a full biography contained with it within the book. Um, you know, you, you, you view him as a figure of obviously of some complexity um, not, and he's not, you know, the cartoon figure he's sometimes described at. But you have a great admiration, I would say, for his skills as a politician, right? I sure. mean, yeah, talk about that. Well, uh, one of my favorite finds was a, a memo uh, um, from uh, Jimmy Carter's advertising man, a guy named Gerald Rafshoon. And it was this, his, his, his proposal for a strategy for the 1980 presidential election. And one of the things he said and he underlined was, Jimmy Carter is smarter than Ronald Reagan, right? Everyone thought they were smarter than Ronald Reagan. Uh, one of the things that our, our mutual friend Rick Hertzberg told me, he was Jimmy Carter's speechwriter, was they were absolutely convinced that all they needed to do was get Ronald Reagan on stage with Jimmy Carter for a debate side by side before the election. And then people would see what a shallow, extremist, old, uh, unqualified, you know, guy who co-starred with a monkey in a movie in the 1950s, Ronald Reagan was. And um, what they willfully did not understand was that Ronald Reagan has never lost a political debate in his life. Uh, in 1967, uh, Ronald Reagan- I love this story about Robert Kennedy. I, this was like, again, totally new to me. And, but I read this in your book and I, it was just fascinating to me. Yeah, so Guys, they appeared I'm together. I mean, this must have been right at the beginning of, of, of satellite TV. I and mean, it's a pretty remarkable thing. He appears together on a TV hookup. I don't know if it's an Oxford Union or something with Robert Kennedy to debate the Vietnam War. And of course, Robert Kennedy thinks that he's smarter than this you know, guy who started with a monkey, Ronald Reagan. And after the debate, uh, Ronald Reagan has so tied Robert F. Kennedy, who is you know, a person of extraordinary confidence and intelligence and moral grandeur in knots, that he screams at a reporter, who uh, screams at an aide, who was the person who got me involved in this? I never want to be, you know, I never want to, you know, be in the same room with that guy again, right? That happens again and again and again. And the fact of the matter is that happened with 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 Pat Brown in 1966, the year before. But 
somehow Robert F. Kennedy didn't notice that. It happened, you know, uh, with, um, with Nelson Rockefeller in 1968. It happened with Gerald Ford when he almost defeated him for the presidency, uh, presidential nomination in 1976. Again and again, he's being underestimated by people who don't grasp how remarkable his skills are at um, connecting with audiences, uh, coming up with clear black and white uh, uh, moral uh, explanations of how the world works in ways that only he could do. He could find like moral distinctions where no one else could and be completely. And, and here's what, what, what occurs to me, at, you know, at, in reading the book, you know, where, where, you know, ultimately you have Reagan running rings uh, around Carter and winning. That's, that's the spoiler alert right there. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I want to give away. They the go end. into the debate tied and we all know how it ends. 2020, uh, the 20, the 1980 election. I don't want to give away who won, but um, I mean. The American people won, Jeff. Sorry, the American people won. Yes, well, we're well, in the street. But but, don't you ever, as a, a person on the left, you know, aren't, aren't you are more sympathetic, at least in the in, in general outlines to 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 Carter than you are to Reagan? Why why are you so admir? Why do you admire Reagan's political skills so much when you don't admire the polit the the politics he stands for? Well. The only parts in the writing of this book where I literally shed tears uh, was um, writing about, um, and this is something that goes back to what we said, and a lot of the spoiler alert, the assassination of Harvey Milk by a policeman who literally uh, assassinated him for political reasons and was celebrated by the cops and uh, was able to literally get away with murder. He was convicted by manslaughter because basically the city of San Francisco threw the case because they were afraid of what would happen otherwise. That made me cry. The other thing that made me cry was knowing what we know now with the, the march of inequality that was happening during the period that this book was writing, then the period you know, I'm writing about in this book, the way Jimmy Carter so adamantly insisted that the way to solve America's problems was by cutting the budget and the way that Paul Volcker uh, decided that the way to solve America's problems was to squeeze the money supply so hard that he would deliberately induce a recession. And uh, so I, um, I, when I write about, when I titled the book Reagan Land and say that this is kind of America's right turn, in a lot of ways I see Jimmy Carter as an exemplification of the right turn as well. Now there's a, there's a real cunning going on here in that, well, Jimmy Carter is embracing this politics of, you know, austerity and, you know, saying, you know, everyone needs to turn down their thermostats and make do with less and spend less and, and entertain less and do everything less. Ronald Reagan's response is, well, I'm going to cut all your taxes, right? And I'm, the party's never going to stop, right? And of course, this is this absolute intellectual fantasy that somehow cutting income taxes across the board is going to so uh, goose the economy that there, there will be no negative consequences for anyone. The, the glibness was absolutely extraordinary. So when you know, the, the voters were, choice, chosen, were, were faced with a choice between someone who said, I'll be a steady hand in the tiller and I'm gonna you know, basically um, make you sacrifice, and the guy who says, I'm gonna be a steady hand in the tiller and I'm gonna put money in your pocket, which of course, after the New Deal is what Democrats used to do, you know, vote people you know, kind of favors and jobs from the, the American treasury, is there any wonder that they that chose the smiling guy who, who, who promised them, you know, loaves and fishes and magic beans that were going to take them into the stratosphere? Um, what, um, there's, a, there's a question from one of the audience, which I think is, is an, an interesting one. And certainly, you know, it's raised in your book, which is, you know, Democrats turned on Carter really right. fast. Yeah. Do, do, do Democrats eat their own? I mean, you, you, you don't see Republicans turning on right. their presidents with any, I mean, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush had a, had a problem, Pat Buchanan ran against him, right. but by and large, Republicans, uh, you know, fall in line. Right. What is it about Democrats and what is right. it about Carter right. that, you know, alienated. Well, Democrats. the first, the first, you know, circular firing squad, squad among uh, Democrats during the Carter era uh, was initiated by Jimmy Carter. Right. This is a guy who dotes on his identity as kind of a postpartisan. You know, a guy who, uh, you know, is not part of, you know, 
the, the courthouse gang, you know, when he was a politician in the South and, you know, not part of the, you know, kind of the swamp, what we call it now, you know. Um, one of the first things he does to kind of explain to official Washington who he is and what he's about is he brings as his, 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 his main advisors, all these people from Georgia no one has heard of who have no experience in Washington. One of the second things he does is there's a big inaugural concert at Kennedy Center, right? And uh, the ticket that Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill gets, which is, by the way, you know, who is, by the way, the most you know, powerful Democrat besides Jimmy Carter in Washington, and the guy that Jimmy Carter needs in harness with him he's gonna, if he's going to accomplish anything in, in Washington, the tickets he gets are on the, the highest balcony. And T Tip O'Neill calls... Jimmy Carter's right-hand man, Hamilton Jordan, from, from, from Georgia, who literally the only job, I confirmed this with Hamilton Jordan's son, the only job since he got out of the army uh, was basically advancing Jimmy Carter's political fortune since the 1960s. He says, I'm gonna, can I, I'm gonna use a bad word, I'm gonna ream your ass, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so in order, we already have a civil war within the Democratic Party. On behalf of this guy, let me tell you, I'll, I'll repeat a story that might have jumped out at you from, the, from, from Jimmy Carter's diaries that's in the book. Do you remember that um, there was a law passed, and I write about it, and he writes about it in his diary, in which basically it expanded the numbers of federal judges yes, enormously. Yes, that was a big, right? big deal, yeah. That was a big deal. And in, in, and in his diary, Jimmy Carter complains about that. Because he says, oh, I'm going to have this burden of, you know, nominating dozens of federal judges. Can you imagine, you know, what Donald Trump or George Bush or Ronald Reagan with or Richard Nixon would do with the opportunity to place his stamp on the federal gener uh, judiciary for another generation? Yeah, it's, so for it's Jimmy Carter, he has this contempt for power. He has this contempt for politics, right? He would announce these enormous legislative initiatives without consulting with his fellow Democrats, one iota. I mean, he he studies. You know, he's the engineer, right? He's 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 the guy who has the answer to every problem. He's going to come at his uh, problem like a Vulcan, right? Just kind of com for complete reason. He reads the report of the Army Corps of Engineers and realizes that there are fifty or sixty. I don't remember the exact number. Water projects, basically giant public works dams that were not rational that they didn't deserve, they didn't deliver value to the American people. So he was gonna cancel them unilaterally. His interior, uh, his interior secretary learns about this announcement when he gets off a plane at the Western Governors Conference, when all the governors are saying, why are you destroying my political career? <laughs> I mean, this is this is this is the circular firing squad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. You know, we, we we don't we don't have a lot of time left, and and I know one of the things you always warn about in your work is presentism, which is mm -hmm. you know trying to you know explain the explain you know what's going on today by you know looking to you know using history as as some sort of guide to the present. Yeah. But I can't you know. You know, I'll talk you about this interview yeah. without without mentioning Donald Trump. No, that's a problem. He's seen the book. I talk about his talk, talk about Trump in in the context of the book, and also you know the, with the political moment we're in now. Right. So so broadly speaking, I don't think I I would like to think that you cannot read these four books I've written about the rise of the Republican right and their uh, coming hegemony over the United States of America, and be completely surprised with anything that happens in Washington today with the Republican Party from, you know, Mitch McConnell to Donald Trump to, you know, the former congresswoman who, you know, uh, worried about witchcraft, right? That's all there. I mean, the, the, the story of the Trump era is basically the lunatics running the asylum, that basically these people are, uh, who had always existed, you know, in various kind of pockets of the Republican coalition are now kind of running the coalition. Um, the way that Donald Trump uh, makes his appearance in um, the book is twice. <laughs> Once is during the 1980 Democratic Convention when all these, you know, kind of New York socialites uh, host big fancy parties for the, the visiting Democrats. Donald Trump, of course, is a Democrat. So he sponsors the Democratic, uh, he sponsors the hoedown <laughs> for the Texas delegation which he co-hosts with the publisher of Ms. Magazine. So I guess that speaks to a certain sort of ideological cynicism on his part, right? But the other way he appears is, is basically in 1979 when 
Ronald Reagan, for some reason, decides to announce his candidacy in, in New York City, is that he is kind of the symbol of, even as the city is kind of falling apart post-bankrupt New York, in which, you know, the buses can only go 30 miles an hour on the freeway, and, you know, there's bank robberies, and there's, like, you know, police forces being decimated, and there's, you know, garbage piling up on the streets, Midtown Manhattan has really started to thrive. And one of the reasons Midtown Manhattan is really starting to thrive is that uh, Mayor, uh, Abe, uh, Mayor Ed Koch, who also is a character in the book, uh, representing kind of the right word drift of the Democratic Party, decides that he's going to um, initiate this program in which he's going to give tax abatements to developers in order to uh, jazz up downtown. And Donald Trump uses this opportunity to uh, turn a grand old building, the Commodore, into um, what is it called again? The, uh, the Grand Hyatt. Grand Hyatt, right? He flays it's, off. And it's just, it's, it's, it, it is, it is, it has now been an eyesore for decades, right? And he Next literally steals $50 million from the city in order to do it. And there's a, there's a, the profile of him in the New York Times while this is going on is the one that basically the New York Times, when they did their piece about how much money he's stolen in tax dollars, did their big, you know, takeout that Mary Trump, you know, was the informant for, um, they apologized for it, basically. You know, because they reported with a straight face that, um, you know, he owned all these buildings when they really his dad owned them, that he was driving around in a limousine that his dad had really bought, you know, that he had never made a bad deal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that becomes an allegory in that particular part of the book about how, Mer how America, how New York is kind of falling to uh, these kind of con men who are using kind of the ideology of business and the free market to loot the public purse. Uh, it's kind of the dark side of the Reagan era that, you know, was symbolized, I think, maybe by Brett Easton Ellis and, uh, you know, American Psycho. Um, one of our uh, uh, audience members asked, you know, is this a story of dueling forms of austerity, public mm. governmental austerity versus individual familial austerity? That seems like a, a little bit of an esoteric question, but yeah, it's okay. an interesting thought. Um, well, of course, Ronald Reagan rejected austerity, right? I um, mean, he, he, he said, I'm going to, you know, he, he, he was basically for austerity for, for thee, but not for me, right? I mean, when he was president, he literally cut the uh, public housing budget by something like 80%, right? So that's a lot of austerity. But at the same time, he's, you know, cutting taxes and, and uh, basically giving money to the rich, handing it, handing it over to them to left and right. Jimmy Carter had his own version of public austerity, right? He induced a recession intentionally uh, because he thought that that's what it took to wring out inflation, which is one of the great tragedies in American politics, by the way, because it was it was based on an intellectual theory that you needed you needed to lower the budget deficit in order to cut inflation. Well, now we have no inflation and a massive budget deficit, which shows that all that austerity, all that misery, all that unemployment, that destruction of the American industrial, you know, kind of uh, employment system was completely for naught, a complete moral waste, right? Uh, household austerity. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting subject because while all this is going on, uh, there's a, a massive deregulation of banking that goes on while Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, Jim, you know, basically, presidents since Dwight Eisenhower have been begging for the repeal of the rule that doesn't let them compete uh, in, in, the number, uh, in the amount of interest they pay on savings accounts. And the reason for that is if they compete, they're going to all become speculators and try to kind of make that money uh, pay by investing in dodgy investments, which of course they do with consequences that are all around us. Jimmy Carter was the only president who bit. But while that's happening, this is also a Supreme Court thing. This is the Marquette case that gets rid of usury, usury rates. That's why all your credit cards are, are based in Joe Biden's uh, Delaware. Um, while this is happening, Americans have less money, but they're, they're, they're getting to massive credit card debt. So they're basically rejecting austerity. This whole cycle of an American economy built on debt, you know, buy now, pay later. Uh, this idea of leverage is, is what's coming into place in the period well, in which and, it's and supposed to be. And deregulation under Carter mm -hmm. has this progressive right. patina. They deregulate right. the trucking and the airlines. And uh, just parenthetically, I know this from my other life, the, the architect of okay. that was Breyer, Ted Kennedy yeah. and his aide, Stephen Breyer, um, who, who, I mean, so, so the, the notion of activist government, like government spending money, government, um, you know, building bridges, building highways, dams, as you yeah. point out, 
that fell into disrepute with the modern Democratic Party and, and with, with predictable electoral consequences. Yeah. Um, God, where to begin with that? There's a story in which uh, um, uh, Jimmy Carter has a stack of uh, workplace regulations two feet high. Actually, it's blank pieces of paper, but he pretends as if it's a stack of regulations. And he, 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 he just like knocks it off the table or something for some photo op. You know, uh, he, <laughs> I have a, a scene where he's, you know, on, on the campaign trail, you know, in the last days of the Democratic, uh, you know, in the 1980 presidential election, speaking to a bunch of Democratic activists in New Jersey and saying, you know, the Republicans are greedy and we believe in, you know, the ability of government to help ordinary people the way every Democrat, you know, talks in the home stretch of every election. And then almost in the next sentence, he said, and we've cut regulations more than any, you know, and any administration in history, right? And it was seen as this, you know, sort of brave, bold thing. A lot of the deregulatory drive was based on, you know, I discovered, you know, corporate propaganda that was kind of cooked up by basically focus groups and ad men that, you know, was, was paper thin, you know, it was, it was based on complete fantasy. The idea that, you know, factories were, um, environmental regulations were, you know, causing the closing of factories, right? Uh, researchers couldn't find any more than a minuscule amount of jobs that have been lost to environmental regulations, but actually enormous amount of jobs, were, you know, uh, created by environmental relations. So a lot of stuff was just basically, um, and this is a big part of the story I tell in the book, Corporate America, uh, the people I call the boardroom Jacobins, who had once um, kind of proudly uh, accepted the idea that they were partners with business and government in creating this sort of broadly shared prosperity, turning their backs on that in a time of falling profits, and um, basically joining, I have a scene in which they literally join in a meeting room in Vitruid Vigory's house, joining with the new right, these populist kind of people who are um, uh, uh, organizing discontent to form a coalition uh, around, uh, well, uh, first John Connolly, that's a little fun part of the story. Uh, But then John Connolly falls by the wayside, no one remembers him. And eventually business backs and the new right backs Ronald Reagan. And by the way, quite reluctantly in the case of business because they thought he was crazy. So, okay. you know, there's no foregone conclusion that Ronald Reagan is going to be the guy. We, we, we don't have um, uh, much time left, and, and, and I want to make our audience read the book. Um, I, and, and I'd like to make them read it. Talking about you. Um, you have you know, this in, enormous achievement. It, it's funny, we, you know, Reaganland does not include the Reagan presidency. Yeah. What, what are your plans for your next work? What, what, what do you want to? What do you want to do next? I'm going to next? Disney World. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 uh, I, my next big project, my next kind of big, you know, four five year project. giant book yeah. project is, is going to be a global history of the 1830s and how uh, the coming of industrialism, uh, um, its effect that it had in kind of traditional societies and traditional ways of life around the world, from you know the Trail of Tears to the Chartist movement in England. Um, so I'm, my next book is going to be about capitalism. And, and why not continue the conservative movement through the, you know, the pinnacle of the Reagan years? Well, that's my life. <laughs> you know, I was born in 1969, and, and it, it has been observed, Jeff, that uh, the, the amount of time that each of my books cover uh, is shorter and shorter, and the books are longer than longer, longer and longer. <laughs> so if I write about, you know, the year 19, uh, you know, uh, 86, in which I, uh, 1982, when I had my bar mitzvah, you know, I mean, um, you know, just writing about Michael Jackson will take 50 pages. So uh, I don't think it's a practical and, and, I mean, just, uh, can we, can, just to, to conclude, I mean, you know, what, what makes your career so remarkable is that you are this eminent historian but you are an independent scholar. You are not a, I mean, you've taught here and there, but you are not a professor. You have done this on your own. What impact do you think your independence as a, a person as, and as a writer has had on your work, if, if any? Well, there's a lot less committee meetings. <laughs> uh, that saves some time. Uh, there's a lot less teaching, although I you know, often envy teachers. Um, I think that um, by trying to um, 
build a body of work that draws on and contributes to uh, the best of the world of scholarly history, uh, but also uh, is written in a style that's as accessible as possible to the public, um, I hope has uh, created a synthesis that um, adds value in both fields. And I'm just enormously, hum enormously humbled and honored that I've been able to be accepted and make a contribution to you know, what professional historians do in universities. And I'm humbled and honored uh, you know, that uh, people who are picking up a good book to read on the beach read me too. So it's, it's worked out absolutely fantastically and I'm just uh, bottomlessly grateful for the opportunities. I and I think that's a, that's a nice note to end on. And as, as a reader, I am bottoms, bottomlessly grateful uh, for the opportunity to have read these wonderful books. Thank you to the Brooklyn Historical Society. Everybody should go out and buy, and not just buy, but buy and read Reagan Land. So thanks, Rick. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>